So we've already seen how the RSA encryption looks like well, for schoolbook RSA. And now just to recap what these pieces are, I'll do the schoolbook signature version. Again, schoolbook in bright red there. You should definitely have some padding on your message. So schoolbook RSA signature. Well, the key generation looks exactly the same as in the encryption system. And so again, you need to pick two primes, you compute the product, you compute phi of n, yada, yada, yada. So then the signing operation, where you take a message. Now the message, well, it's not necessarily less than n. Actually, here we could have an arbitrary large message. What we need to achieve, so this is actually a typo, so this should be h of m, and h of m, the hash of the message, has to be less than n. So we then compute the hash of the message um, and raise that to the power of d. Now, we are the only party who knows d, so this one is using our private key and nobody else should be able to compute such, a, such an s. You'll notice that the signing mechanism in RSA looks very much like the dec decryption mechanism, except for this extra hash function here. And then for the verification, um, there similarly, we'll, we take first the signature, compute the power E of it, which gives us some H prime, and then we accept the signature if it matches H of the message. So we also have to compute the hash of the message, and then we verify whether those two things are the same. So that corresponds to the encryption operation. It uses the public key, well, the exponent e and the modulus n. So the reasons that this work is the same as far as encryption. So again, using FAMAS, the last the, the little theorem, and well, the h of m. One thing is that it helps in signing arbitrary long messages, but also it already destroys this homomorphic property. It destroys the attacks that we have seen. So putting the hash there has its benefit, but we couldn't do this for the encryption system because then, uh, well, you can't recover the message from the hash of the message. But for signature system, it is okay to have one-way functions everywhere. So as long as the um, message, well, sorry, as long as the hash function is collision resistant so that nobody can find two messages which hashed the same number, or well, worse would be if it's not pre-image resistance, if somebody could take your signature and then find another pre-image M prime which has the same H of M because then your signature is also a signature on M prime. But assuming it's a good hash function, then, well, this, this hash of M is safe to sign. Um, and really as a warning, do not normally assume that you have that signing matches decryption encryption matches verification. This is super, super unusual, only holds for RSA. Okay, so after all these warnings, like when do we use RSA in practice? And I mentioned already in the example of the key generation that PGP is using it. So here is the public key of PGP. Now, um, you don't really see any primes here. So let's look at this. So this is uh, a dummy key that I generated just for this course. Um, so we're also going to look at the secret key, but don't worry, this is not my normal PGP key. So when you look at the key with PGP dump, so that's actually a way to inspect what's in there. Yep, was just generated, and you're going to see that it's truncated to the right. Um, this goes off for quite a distance. These are 2048 bits. It's uh, not excessively large, but reasonably large RSA key. And then the public exponent, this e, is just 17 bits. And so this is the number I mentioned before. This is the 2 to the 16 plus 1. 65537, that is a prime. And it's a fairly common or typical exponent that you get when you use PGPs. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff, like meta information of what this key is and which algorithms are being used and so on. Let's also look at the secret key. So in the secret key, again, n is included. It also includes e for some reason. Um, more interestingly, here is d. Oh, dangerous. And then hmm, there are p and q. Now, 
in principle, when you're done with key generation, you should remove P and Q because, well, there's only the private key and the public key that I output. There's no more P and Q sitting now. So this is violating the property that you shouldn't keep stuff around that you don't need. And this is now in the private key, which is stored for, well, forever, basically. So here's a P and there's a Q, and there's also some other thing U, which we can't make sense of yet. And of course, that's a lead up to making sense of it. Okay, so what are these things? What is PGP actually using with RSA? PGP is using something which is called RSA CRT. The CRT stands for the Chinese Remainder Theorem. Um, and well, I've been putting here again the rule of forgetting pieces that you don't use. And actually, well, in this case, these pieces are being used. So P and Q are actually useful if you want to speed up your operations. Now let's look at what is actually happening in RSA. So the public side, you can be nice, you can make your E small and you can make it sparse. So this 2 to 16 plus 1 is both short, has only 17 bits, and most of these bits are zero, so it's just a whole bunch of squarings and at the very end a multiplication. That's very nice to compute. For the private exponent, well, you could flip things around and you pick your d to be small, you pick that to be 65537, but anybody could guess that and also they would see that your e is big and random and go like, ah, let me check, maybe d is just 3 or maybe just the special number. So you can't do that. And so what you normally encounter in the decryption operation or in signing operation is that you're doing an exponentiation where this d has as many bits as n. And so similar to the OEP, my d is, my n is assumed to have l bits. So d will have l bits too. So that means we do l squarings and on average l over 2 multiplications. So this will take a while. Not terrible, it's a fast operation, it's polynomial time, but it's still something where if you're assuming you're using a key a lot, you might want to speed it up, and that's what CRT is doing. So let me introduce some notation. So I'm taking the cipher text and I'm reducing it modulo p and I'm reducing it modulo q and I'm calling these cp and cq. And then I'm also taking my private exponent d and I'm reducing it, watch out, modulo p minus 1 and q minus 1. Not model p and q, but p minus 1 and q minus 1. And that is because the cybertext is in the group modulo p, so that is, or q modulo q, so that is on the baseline, and the dp and the dq are in the exponent group. Now when you're computing modulo p, we have already seen Fermat's little theorem, then we know that anything to the p minus 1 is just 1. So the exponent here is naturally reduced modulo p minus 1, and so we can also do this in order to save some time here. So the dp and the dq being reduced modulo p and q, both p and q have half the bit lengths, l over 2 bits, and so these two exponents have l over 2 bits as well. Okay, so I've now taken one exponentiation with an l-bit exponent and turned it into two exponentiations with l over 2 bit exponents. Doesn't really seem to save anything. And I haven't even combined those. I mean, I can combine this if I have m mod p and m mod q, then the Chinese remainder theorem will give me m mod m, mod the product p times q. But there's actually something else which is beneficial, which is why it was important to compute these c reductions here, so that the input is actually smaller. So the inputs are also half the size. And the modulo p and q are half the size. So each squaring on each multiplication that I'm doing is faster. Now if you're doing what is called basic school book multiplication, then it grows by a factor of 4 if you double the size. So it's a quadratic growth. If you're doing something slightly faster, called Karatsuwa multiplication, which you hopefully have seen in your bachelor's, then it's still about 3 times faster. And then if you're doing a fast multiplication, like asymptotically fast, like schoenhager strassen you're still getting a benefit of a factor of 2. Okay, so this first savings here, well, that's eaten up by doing two of them, 
but this is the speed up that you're getting with RSA CRT. Okay, and then the final thing is you want to combine them into CRT and then of course you can run your general CRT algorithm, but that involves always the inversion of P modulo Q and Q modulo P, at least the generic version, and you can do it for two moduli in a slightly more efficient version, and that involves this U which you have seen in the RSA private key, namely U is P inverse mod Q. And then uh, the PGP standard defines that P is the smaller of the two primes, so P is less than Q, and then U is the inverse of P mod Q. Last thing to verify, well, when you look at this equation here, M is MP plus P times U times M sub Q mod F. Does this match these two pieces, these two equivalences? So first of all, let's look at it mod P. That's the easy one. So modulo P, oh, it does not match because I messed up. There is E minus uh, M sub P missing in parentheses. That's exactly why you should be doing checks. So if you're doing it uh, mod P, then you're getting MP plus zero. Uh, that works. If you're doing it mod Q, you're getting MP mod Q, whatever that is. Well, it's the same because Q is the larger number. Um, then you're getting P times U, but U is P inverse mod Q. So these two cancel. So these give one mod Q. And so I'm left with M times Q plus MP, and then you also see why I'm saying that, oh, I'm missing the minus MP. So there should be a parenthesis here, times MQ minus MP, close parenthesis. So more to the typo, this is uh, how RSA CRT is working. And so that is the end of how we're using RSA in practice. So you well, typically use one of the padding schemes, OEP or PKCS, to pad your message, and then for the decryption step, you're using the CRT method in order to get some speed.